Sir Roy, what future do you foresee for the white man in Central Africa now? Well, of course, I am convinced that the white man has a major part to play in Central Africa because it is the white man that provides the expertise, uh, the capital, uh, what skills are available. And of course, this continent is so badly in need of skills. By the mid-1960s, what started as a hopeful experiment in multiracialism was failing. The Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, which many considered an unholy alliance, was drawing to a bitter end, having only achieved the social purpose of opening up some hotels, cinemas, and swimming pools to blacks in the territories. The last hope for survival of the Federation seemed to rest, among few other things, on the Kariba Dam project. An investigation was made by the Electricity Supply Commission, and in 1941, funds were allocated through the World Bank. Despite contentions and Africans from both northern and southern Rhodesia preferring the dam being constructed on the Kafio River Gorge in northern Rhodesia, a board of experts, simply known as the Panel, decided otherwise, and in September 1956, works on the Kariba Dam project began. No sooner had work on the dam began than a contract for the construction of the supporting town was given out. Within 48 hours of the contract being signed, over 1,300 Europeans and their families arrived in northern Rhodesia. And in just over 19 months, the area was transformed into something of a white settler utopia, with shops, schools, hospitals, and amenities nearly on a par with the Western world. However, the foundations of the entire Kariba project were based on deception that would lead to the death of over 80 Africans and the displacement of over 50,000 locals from their native homes. Furthermore, according to legend, a river spirit in the area known as Nyami Nyami angered that the project would desecrate one sacred land, put a curse on the entire dam project, which would be plagued by many deadly events from start to finish. It all began with the ambitious desire to tame one of the biggest rivers in the entire Africa, the mighty Zambezi. The Zambezi River is the fourth longest river in Africa. It's the longest east flowing and the largest river flowing into the Indian Ocean from Africa. Over 2,574 kilometers in length, the river flows through Angola, Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. Despite its magnitude, the source of this great river is a relatively small black marshy dambo in the dense undulating Miyambo woodland, 50 kilometers north of Mwinilunga and 20 kilometers south of Ikelenge in the Ikelenge district of northwestern province of Zambia. The Zambezi's most notable feature is the magnificent Mwasi Otunya, the smoke that thunders, also known as the Victoria Fall. 41% of the Zambezi Basin lie within the borders of Zambia, with the name Zambia itself being derived from that of the mighty Zambezi. But with the coming of the Federation came the idea of damming the great Zambezi, and with that idea came chaos. The double curvature concrete arc dam was constructed on the orders of the government of the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, a federal colony within the British Empire. For both the British and the Federalists, the Kariba Dam not only presented an economic opportunity, but had strong imperial and political symbolism, a chance of uniting and sustaining the foundering federation, the last kick of a dying force. 
The dam project equally gave white settlers a stage to display their capacity to tame and subdue even what was perceived as the most treacherous African landscape. The dam would be a mark of white dominance and had to be built at all costs. Unsurprisingly, after its completion, journalists such as Frank Clemens would describe the project as a triumph over the dark and dangerous Kariba Gorge whose vicinity was a savage wilderness. Others would proudly declare that the Zambezi River had been brought under man's control for the first time in history. Indeed, the mighty Zambezi had been tamed. But how was this even possible? The process was simple but not easy. We plan to build our wall here. But first, we must carry off the main surge of the river from the working site, so we build a diversion tunnel and a channel. In this channel, we build a coffer dam to protect us as we work on sectors of the main wall. And we leave gaps so that when we demolish the coffer dam, the main flow of the river can rush through. And this leaves us with calmer water on the other side. So, we build a second coffer dam. Inside that, we can press on with the main wall, 2,000 feet long, 405 feet high, until at last, the job is done. And that'll take about five years. And behind it will grow a lake that can change the map of Africa. In August 1955, the federal government called for tenders for the construction of the dam, and the Italian company Impressit won the bid. Many were shocked at how a nation as substantially underdeveloped as Italy at the time was given the leading role in implementing such a massive project abroad. But impressive it was, and what followed was indeed an impressive show of engineering. The dam was designed by, among others, André Coyne, French engineer, inventor, and specialist in arc dam. And in September 1956, construction works began with the excavation of the foundation. Construction of the dam would take over 14 million gallons of fuel, 350,000 tons of cement, and 120 million pounds. But this was nothing as compared to the cost of the dam's construction on the environment, animals, and the local people. As their natural habitats were flooded, many animals unable to escape drowned in masses. The only hope for the thousands of native species helpless in the floods was Operation Noah, which though the name sounds ostentatious, was essentially a handful of men searching for animals in the vast expanse of a drowning valley. Some animals were lucky, many others were not. Some people felt that, you know, it was the white man who really wanted to grab our land for his own use. It didn't have any benefit for anyone of us. Some believe the name Kariba, or Kaliba, meaning trap in Zambian language, refers to the rock that thrust out of the swirling water at the entrance of the gorge close to the dam. However, linguistic evidence links Kariba to the Shona word Kariva, which means small trap. According to oral histories, in deceiving the local people of the size of the project, Italian constructors, unable to pronounce the V in Kariba, used the word Kariba instead to describe their intentions as that of putting up a small water trap in the area. Being convinced that what was being built was a Kariba, there was thus little resistance from the local. Though the Kariba was by no means small, it was indeed a trap and more so for the local Tonga people who, in the midst of the largest water basin in the region, were left high and dry. According to Tonga elders in the Sinazongwe district of Zambia's southern province, nearly 57,000 Tongas were moved from their fertile land next to the Zambezi to the plateau areas that suffer from drought and poor soil, thereby disrupting their entire way of life.
They provide a transport, yeah, the government, to, to ferry people, ferry our animals to, uh, to inland where we were hipped. And after that, we started scattering now to build, to start our, our villages. We were moved to very dry lands, very rocky areas, very infertile land. And as a result, there was a lot of resistance when this decision finally was, um, was effected. Uh, Chief Chipepo did resist because they didn't want to leave uh, the, 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 the area because of the, of the alluvial soils that were always fertile. When the water started swell, the swelling backwards, some people, some communities like in Chipepo, for instance, refused to move to give way to the swelling of the water because they felt very genuinely that the white man was using that as a trick to take away their land, which they didn't want to abandon. There was a conflict. Nine people were killed as a result of that resistance that took place. Before the Kariba project, the Tonga expressed their attachment to the Zambezi by self-identifying as Basilwizi, the river people. An alternative to this special identity was Bamulonga, which means people of the river. And in some instances, the Tonga self-identified as Kasambavisi, which means those who know where to take a bath along the crocodile-infested Zambezi River. But after 1940, crocodiles were the least of the Kasambavisi's problems. An existential threat was mounting in the valley, one that would change their livelihood forever. During the resettlement that followed the dam's construction, Tongas in the area had only two options. One was to move to the Zimbabwean side, offering food but no monetary compensation, or the Zambian side, offering at least $270 compensation per person. The choice was easy, albeit disruptive for Tonga family. Meanwhile, Kariba was becoming more pleasant. For the European settlers, of course, especially in the residential village of Kariba Heights, which now had the appearance of a modern city. By the mid-1900s, life in Kariba was described by most white settlers as pleasant and satisfying, with modern churches, Olympic-sized pools, and of course, the Grand Kariba Hotel overlooking the Kariba Dam itself. All seemed to be going well and works on the Kariba were on schedule. However, in 1957, when the dam was almost nearing completion, disaster struck. A disaster that would lead to destruction, death, and a blood sacrifice. Sandesi, <laughs> After experiencing the worst floods ever known on the Zambezi, several Africans and Italian workers have died. But after days of searching, the bodies of the Italian workers are nowhere to be found. Time begins running out as families of the workers are due to arrive in northern Rhodesia from Italy to claim the bodies of their loved ones, 
With little else to do, Batonga elders are asked to assist who demand that a sacrifice be made to Nyami Nyami, the river spirit who appease his wrath. Nyami Nyami was annoyed in a way, hence making that those floods so that the people you know, could, uh, could perish because they don't believe in him now. Nyami Nyami, otherwise referred to as the Zambezi River God or Zambezi River Spirit, is said to be one of the most important gods of the Tonga people and believed to protect the Tonga people and give them sustenance in difficult times. Before the construction of the Kariba Dam, Nyami Nyami was seen as the god of the Zambezi River who resided in the Zambezi River, controlling life in and on its waters. Therefore, what happened in 1957 was seen as revenge of Nyami Nyami, the River Spirit. The construction had provoked in Nyamiami. And the water at that time became very, very strong. Water was going around. And because of that, the walls collapsed. Having failed to locate the bodies of the Italian workers, finally the search party agreed to the terms of the sacrifice. A black cow was slaughtered and floated on the Great River, and the next morning the cow was gone and the workers' bodies were in its place. The disappearance of the calf held no mystery in the crocodile-infested river. However, the reappearance of the workers' bodies three days after they had disappeared could not be explained. By all indication, the dam seemed cursed. Later during construction, some scaffolding gave way and 17 workers fell into a hole and were buried in wet cement. Some say that their remains were picked out, but others insist that they remain entombed in the dam to this very day. Eventually, when the floods receded, engineers rushed to make sure that the dam was completed before the following rainy season. By 1958, both the dam and the relocation of the Tonga was completed. However, no sooner had the people been moved than mysterious illnesses and deaths began. It was a plague like nothing ever seen before, with the mortality as high as 80 to 90 percent. Most adult patients died within 24 hours after the onset of symptoms, while children died within six hours after being taken ill. In November 1959, Dr. M. H. Webster, at the time Director of Medical Services of the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasa Land, wrote a letter to Dr. D. G. Stan, Professor of Pharmacology and Chief Research Officer from the University of Pretoria. The subject, serious mortality from a mysterious disease affecting a certain tribe of Africans in Northern Rhodesia. An investigation was launched and what was discovered was shocking. than St. Paul's Cathedral and nearly 2,000 feet long, the Great Dam has triumphed over all difficulties. Several thousand people had assembled for the very big event, the official opening. The period following the completion of the Kariba Dam was one of pride, ceremony and celebration. However, it was also one of mysterious illness and death. It was a plague like nothing ever seen before, with a mortality as high as 80 to 90 percent and certain death within 24 hours. What was the mysterious illness killing Africans in the Kariba area? And was it in any way connected to the curse of the Kariba Dam? What were some of the facts on the ground? First and most obvious was that the illnesses and deaths began after the construction of the Kariba Dam and the relocation of Africans to resettlement areas roughly around September 1959. Secondly, according to information supplied by Dr. Webster, the trouble was limited to a small group of villages containing some 500 people and localized in an area around the confluence of the Lusita and Zambezi River. Thirdly, some villages were hit harder than others with strong family connections between the consecutive cases of the disease. Deaths were also said to be higher among those that were considered the most 
uncivilized of the tribes that were moved to the new settlement area. Those that moved the longest distance away from their original homeland and whose members were reluctant to eat European type foods such as maize and beans but preferred subsisting chiefly on fruits, roots and tubers of plants. Another important piece of information was that at the time of the strange disease, the affected areas were also afflicted by a very severe drought. As such, one effect was that the above ground portions of wild plants had been severely damaged, resulting in it being very difficult for Africans to identify the plants, especially those that resembled the species they had been accustomed to eating in their abandoned homeland. This often led to confusion, Poisonous plants were mistaken for edible species with fatal results. European investigations into the mysterious illnesses and deaths around the Zambezi faced many challenges. Not only was the issue shrouded in allegations of witchcraft and black magic, but African chiefs were very reluctant and often hostile when it came to giving permission for specimens to be taken from their people or from food or other materials in their huts or on their new land. Chiefs were even more opposed to the idea of conducting autopsies or the removal of specimens of organs from their deceased relatives. However, as the cases of deaths escalated, Africans became more concerned and less hostile and after extensive research and investigation, it was concluded by Stain and his team that it appeared reasonable and feasible to conclude that the disease was caused by the eating, in a raw or uncooked state, of one or more of the following plants, a. Dioscoria quartiniana, b. Acalypha indica, c. Species of amaranthus, and d. Other unknown poisonous plants. Following their findings, the team proposed educating and warning Africans, especially children, adequate education by exhibiting specimens or colored pictures of the plants concerned, the poisonous as well as edible, was to commence immediately in schools. With the mystery of the strange deaths around Kareba resolved, life seemed to return back to normal for the people of the Zambezi, but not for long. It was now the 1960s, and in 1964, Zambia had gained independence, but Zimbabwe had not. On 11th November 1965, Southern Rhodesia's government, led by Prime Minister Ian Smith, proclaimed a unilateral declaration of independence from the United Kingdom. This attracted the world's attention and created yet another substantial threat to the precious Kariba Dam. there can be any doubt in anybody's mind. We speak from experience. We know what we are talking about. We have been successful because we were virtually independent before we declared our independence. And this is the big failure as far as so many of the countries to the north of us were concerned. They got something by name, handed to them on a plate, but in reality, in fact, they didn't have it. They never had it. On November 11, 1965, the Rhodesian Broadcasting Corporation made a public announcement for Rhodesians to stand by for an important pronouncement by the Prime Minister Ian Smith. And after 13.15 local time, Prime Minister Smith made his announcement. We, the government of Rhodesia, in humble submission to Almighty God, who controls the destinies of nations, conscious that the people of Rhodesia have always shown unswerving loyalty and devotion to Her Majesty the Queen, and earnestly praying that we and the people of Rhodesia will not be hindered in our determination to continue exercising our undoubted right to demonstrate the same loyalty and devotion, and seeking to promote the common good so that the dignity and freedom of all men may be assured, do, by this proclamation, adopt, enact, and give to the people of Rhodesia the constitution annexed here too. 
In his speech, Smith declared that the government of Rhodesia had unilaterally declared independence against the wishes of Her Majesty's colonial office and the British government in London. This immediately gave rise to nationalist movements and a war in Rhodesia to create an independent Zimbabwe. Yeah. By 1966, several African nationalist organizations recognized by the Organization for African Unity, OAU, had established offices and military bases in Zambia. Among them were the Zimbabwe People's Revolutionary Army, ZIPRA, the African National Congress, ANC, the Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO of Namibia, Mozambique's African National Congress, and the Movement for the Popular Liberation of Angola, MPLA. It is important for me to underline what our position is. Since majority rule has not yet been achieved, the nationalists must continue the war and we will continue to support them in their intensified armed struggle. The Geneva Conference is another front in the liberation war and as part and parcel of the effort to intensify the struggle and to expose the enemy at every step. This made Zambia a target for acrimony, especially from Rhodesia and South Africa. The goal of the racist white regimes in the South was simple, incapacitate Zambia to suffocate African freedom fighters. And one of the key points of critical installations in Zambia is the Kariba Dam. Reports in the Southern African newspapers were that the South African army was drawing up plans for Israeli-type strikes against guerrilla holdings in Zambia and that Vosta, the Prime Minister of South Africa, had promised to hit Zambia so hard that its people would never forget it. Any attack on the Kariba Dam and its people would prove a disaster of unimaginable proportion and already there were some allegations that the dam had been mined. Officially, Ian Smith denied any intentions to attack the dam, but this was Ian Smith, and he was not one known to always play by the book. Rapidly, a contingency plan was initiated. Tests were made to see if copper and diesel fuel could be moved in and out of Zambia by air, and more importantly, Royal Air Force rough javelin fighters and a Hastings transport plane arrived with main of the rough regiment as part of a standby force in case of action against Kariba Dam in Rhodesia. However, the rough did not come without complications. It is not very clear whether or not Zambia's first Republican president, Kenneth Kaunda, purposely invited the British for military action to deal with the illegal Smith regime. Some reports claim that as early as February 1964, Kaunda had publicly offered Zambia to the British as a military base to deter a Rhodesian rebellion. To be sure, in 1968, President Kaunda did visit Britain and met with Mr. Wilson to discuss, among other things, the problem brewing in Rhodesia. For Kaunda and the UNIP government, Rhodesia's UDI posed not only the certainty of economic damage to Zambia, but also an uncertain military threat which compelled a positive response. It was not possible to simply ignore UDI. There were powerful ideological imperatives and domestic political pressures as well as material considerations that ruled out inaction or delay as alternatives. We must expose Ian Smith for what he is, an ostrich head in the sand before the eyes of the world. We must isolate, isolate him and completely strengthen the fighting capacity and effectiveness of the nationalist gorillas. Thus, on November 12th, a company of troops was moved to each of the three strategic points along the 10th Zambezi border as a token reaction to the two battalions Rhodesia had deployed along her northern frontier. However, Zambia was clearly in no position to defend itself and after further consideration, the units were withdrawn on November 23rd to minimize the risks of incidents or provocation. On November 28th, following lengthy deliberations and cabinet approval, President Kaunda formally requested both a British force to seize Kariba Power Station on the south bank of the Zambezi and air cover to 
protect Zambia from Rhodesian retaliation. The initial British reaction was distinctly unenthusiastic, but outright rejection was avoided when London was confronted with the specter of the alternative Ghanaian and Egyptian troops along the Zambezi or an even more chilling prospect of a Red Army in Blue Berets. Thus, after heated negotiations, the British finally offered a battalion of ground troops for the defense of Zambia, which was rejected by the Zambian cabinet on December the 2nd. Nevertheless, the ministers did agree apparently unanimously to accept the squadron of javelin jet fighters and their accompanying raider environment. It was an unhappy compromise and moreover, British occupation of Zambia's only three international airports gave Wilson the control he so desperately wanted over armed intervention in Rhodesia by African states and others. President Kaunda himself recognized the poor bargain but accepted it reluctantly, clinging to the slim hope that the minimal British military presence in Zambia could ultimately lead to deeper British commitment. Fortunately, despite the high risk, Kariba Dam was spared during the Liberation War. On the other hand, the Bush War in Rhodesia would continue until the country revoked its UDI in December 1979. And following a brief period of direct British rule, the country was granted internationally recognized independence under the name Zimbabwe in 1980. When the the white man tried to construct the dam. They constructed it in such a way that um, it was not able to resist the um, pressure of the water from up, uh, upstream, and it collapsed. The very first time they made an attempt, that was 1957, it collapsed. But all of us believed earnestly that it collapsed because Nyaminyami did not want them to build the dam there. We didn't realize that it was just the, uh, the technology that had failed in the project. We believed earnestly that it was Nyami Yami who didn't want any disturbance where he lived. So later on, when um, the Italians came, they built it in a concave manner, you know, so that at least you know the pressure of the water did not easily push it downstream. And as you can see, it has withstood the pressure of the water of the, of the Zambezi from 1958 when it was uh, finally concluded up to this moment. It has been over 65 years since the construction of the Kariba Dam. And despite the turbulent history that surrounds the concrete facade, the Kariba Dam still stands strong. It has also been over 65 years since groups such as the Tonga were forcibly removed from the valley to pave way for the Kariba Dam project. However, most of these communities, both in Zambia and Zimbabwe, are still trying to find their feet. <laughs> In Zambia, over the past decades, a number of developmental projects have been initiated to improve the lives of peoples relocated from the valley. But many community leaders and international experts maintain that restitution efforts have failed to improve the living conditions of the majority of these people in the three major districts of Zambia's southern province. To this very day, the people in these areas remain highly vulnerable, heavily reliant on national and international food aid, and despite the tourism and fishing opportunities of Lake Kariba, poverty in the general area remains high. It took only five years for the Kariba project to be completed, but for the peoples dislocated from the valley where the dam now stands, 65 years later, it would take many more years to break free from the curse of the Kariba Dam. <laughs>